This is Digital Pathology Today. Now here's your host, Dr. Joseph Anderson. Welcome to this very special year-end edition of Digital Pathology Today. We're going to look back at some of the hot topics and memorable guests we've had on the podcast in 2020. We'll go way back, over 20 to 100 years, to the foundations of pathology and look at what pathology as a profession has done well. We'll look at comparisons of pathology to radiology in terms of barriers to adoption and timelines in converting to digital systems. 2020 was certainly a memorable year, and the most striking event or series of events were related to the global COVID-19 pandemic, which facilitated a remote sign-out for primary diagnosis. Were we ready for this global health emergency? Regulatory barriers, specifically CLIA and FDA regulations, were temporarily waived or came down to facilitate the immediate adoption of telepathology. We'll look at regulation in the emerging field of regulatory sciences and hopefully clear up some of the misconceptions. If someone's going to regulate the space, it might as well be us. How can we use regulation as a tool to fuel innovation and not as a detriment or a hindrance? And finally, we'll uncover the truth of the much-talked-about global shortage of pathologists and how can new technologies such as digital pathology and artificial intelligence help to ease this burden. This episode will feature previous guests Tony Magliocco, Ajit Singh, Matthew Hanna, Joe Lenners, Mark Tuttle, Michael Isaacs, Dan Milner, and much more. This episode of Digital Pathology Today has been brought to you in part by JAV Advisors. With over 16 years experience, JAV Advisors focuses on business and management consulting for digital pathology and artificial intelligence in deployment within histology, pathology, and cytology laboratories throughout the world. Call 213-258-6268 for more information. J.A.V. Advisors. Digital pathology has been with us for over 20 years. The profession of surgical pathology using the light microscope, however, is much, much older, going back well over 100 years. What has the profession done well? In many ways, it serves as the foundation of clinical medicine, many say. Let's hear from Dr. Tony Magliocco from Protean Biodiagnostics and former chair of Moffitt Cancer Center. What have we done well as a profession, and how can we build on this proud tradition to move medicine forward in the 21st century? Pathologists really form the, the science of medicine. Sir William Osler said, you know, your medicine is only as good as your pathology, and pathologists really provide that scientific basis to medicine, which is, you know, very much otherwise uh, art that's been passed down through the ages, and medicine is much older than science. But pathologists were really excellent at classifying diseases, at bringing new technology to the lab, you know, making really critical discoveries about cellular function. They created the whole discipline of surgical pathology, where we started understanding different subtypes of cancer, the importance of staging as the cancer spread and classifying, and then the development of molecular pathology, which really began in earnest maybe back at the 80s, where it it grew into a whole new discipline where uh, pathologists led the way in, in being able to classify the genetic and molecular basis of, of cancer that led to discovery and innovation of new therapeutic treatments for cancer. So pathologists have always been very much at the forefront of discovery, working really closely with their colleagues in clinical medicine and bridging the gap between clinical medicine and peer research. In the journey to go digital, it's only natural to look towards our counterpart specialty, radiology, who appears to be much further along in the journey. So what are some of the fundamental similarities and differences between pathology and radiology, and why is radiology 5 to 15 years ahead of us? Here's Laurent Pantanowitz, head of anatomic pathology at the University of Michigan and global thought leader in digital pathology and pathology informatics. There are fundamental differences which is why I believe radiology are way ahead of us, probably a decade ahead of us in imaging and also ahead of us in AI today. The difference is, number one, radiology went digital and their transformation was really to get rid of the film, the film which was expensive, difficult to archive, paying lots of people to pull the film. And by going digital, they entirely got rid of the radiology film. Not only did moving to an image provide benefits such as portability, allowing multiple radiologists to view that image and so forth. They also, it made a lot of business sense to get rid of the film, which was expensive, toxic, large file rooms, etc. The other thing is radiology came up with a standard 
for their images, which was DICOM. So most of the vendors that provide radiology products, whether it's a PEX or a CT scan or an ultrasound machine, all of them comply to the same standard and they make images in DICOM format. That means it's very easy for you to mix and match and buy stuff or save images or even go back and look at a CT scan from many years ago and open it up and you'll be able to do that because it's in the format that you know is standardized back then and is still used today. The other thing is their process does not kill workflow. It actually promotes the workflow in radiology, which is a continuous process. As a patient comes in and gets an image, that image doesn't get held and batched. It gets sent straight away to a radiologist who looks at that image and provides an interpretation. Compare that to pathology where, number one, we do not get rid of the slide. Scanning the slide just adds an extra step and we still have the slide. So if we could get rid of making the slide, that would be a business advantage. But we're actually adding a step and adding a cost to our whole process. That's number one. Number two is, uh, you know, the images we generate in pathology are digital slides. And some people like to call them maybe virtual microscopy slides or e-slides. They pretty much remain in the silo within pathology. We're the only people that use these images and look at them. We don't share them with the enterprise and everyone else. And that's a problem because the business case is that, well, if pathology is going to use it, we buy it ourselves and we have to fund it. Whereas radiology images are shared with everyone in the enterprise. If a patient has a chest x-ray, the internist can see it, the ER doc, the surgeon. And so the, the enterprise lands up purchasing that system, not just the department themselves. So again, the return on investment for radiology is much easier than it is for us in pathology. The next problem in pathology is we never started with a standard like a DICOM standard. In pathology, all the vendors develop their own images, all different proprietary file formats, and they built their own viewers software to be able to look at those images. And that's been a huge problem in the field going forward because if you have one type of scanner and you want to send this case to an expert to get a second opinion for teleconsultation, if they don't have a viewer that matches your image, well then you're not able to do that. And so we are slowly now moving towards a standard in pathology imaging, uh, which is the DICOM image, uh, but you know we're doing it backwards, and that's been part of the delay. The other thing we suffer from is in pathology we do stuff by batch work, and that's really a, a killer where it comes to workflow. You know, we don't, as a case comes in and the slide gets scanned, that slide doesn't automatically go to a pathologist at this point in time. We hold all the slides, uh, we cut all the slides, we stain them, we cover slip them, and then we batch them on a scanner and then we scan them, you know, all at once or overnight. And so with that batch process, you know, it's disruptive to our workflow. We're not, it's not that efficient. And then, Joe, the final reason really where we differ from radiology is uh, in a regulatory environment. We have what's called CLEAR, the Clinical Lab Improvements Act. CLEAR is restrictive for pathologists in that if we're going to make a diagnosis on an image, we, we have to be within a CLEAR certified facility to do that, like in the lab or in the hospital, whereas radiologists don't abide by these CLEAR regulations, and so they're much more portable. They could look at a radiology image in you know many different locations. We've been fortunate enough to have guests with a broad variety of perspectives on the podcast so far, and who better to add insight to this comparison between pathology and radiology than Dr. Ajit Singh, who has had experience leading digital radiology at Siemens Healthcare, as well as digital pathology at Bioimaging, a a digital imaging company which was subsequently acquired by Roche. Ajit has a unique perspective, uh, paying particular attention to what he calls use cases. That is, what is actually the problem we're trying to solve? And it may not be what we think it is. There are sort of three underlying questions in what you ask. You know, first, first of all, what is similar between the radiology journey and the pathology journey? Second, what is inherently different? The inherent differences may come from the type of modality, and I'll, I'll spend some time on that. Uh, and, and a third area is where, uh, th- the third question you asked was, why is pathology behind radiology or why the journey started late? And, and there's, a, there's a related question that you haven't asked, but that's relevant in this context, which is, is there a room for converging the two or where will the two of them converge, right? Mm. So, so let's first talk about the similarities uh, between radiology and pathology. So number one, they both use images. Number two, they both use images for diagnostics. Number three, 
the type of benefits that came in radiology, if you if you went back 15, 20 years, are going to be very similar to the type of benefits that pathology is going to get. So, so let's talk about some of the benefits that radiology gave, you know, by going digital. So, for instance, the productivity and specifically the productivity of radiologists went up some 20 odd percent. The report turnaround time went down from something like three to four days to several hours. The study availability went up from say, in the 50, 60 percent range to about 100 percent range. And by study availability means there was no such thing as a lost film, which was a very common cause for study non-availability. And then there was handling errors, a clinician viewing. So clinician would typically look at radiology reports, but almost never images in the past because accessing images was hard. For half the time you couldn't find the film. Uh, the clinician viewing has gone up. The comparison to prior studies has gone up by probably a factor of 10. I, I remember way back in the 80s, we were implementing PACS at University of Pittsburgh. And, and they asked us to, you know, sort of size the archive based on the then present rate of accessing old images, which is in the 5% range. And we did it. We set the archive size according to a potential retrieve rate of 5%. And within six months, everything came to a screeching halt. And the reason was now just because it was easy to access past images, the access rate went up to 100% or close to 100%. So our archive was... By, was was small by a factor of 20 almost. So all those changes, both in the sort of the administrative as, aspects or operational aspects, as well as the clinical benefits happened, all of those would happen in pathology or are happening in pathology. The question is, what are the differences? There are, there are three very stark differences. Number one, in radiology, many of the modalities were actually digital native. So for example, CT, the images came digital out of the machine. MR, the images came digital out of the MR machine. And it's, it's so sort of backwards that in the days before PACS, there'll be digital images coming out of a CT and then they'll be printed in analog on the film and be reviewed on film. So the question was, what was the point of going from digital form to film from before we could read it? So, so the fact that many of these modalities were digital helped in the relatively easier adoption of PACs in MR and CT. Whereas in pathology, the images are not digital native. The, the images are analog. I mean, they are, they're sitting on a slide and you can review them through a microscope or you can digitize them, but natively they are not digital. And the process of digitization, as, as we know, is, is still fairly cumbersome. It's time consuming. So that's difference number one. Difference number two is the size of pathology images. You know, as, as big as radiology studies are, if you do a full body scan, it pales in comparison to, to the size of a typical pathology image or a pathology study, anywhere between a factor of 10 to a factor of 100. So while storage is cheap, is relatively inexpensive, transmission is still not able to keep pace with the size of pathology images. That's a second stark difference. And, and the third is, as the display resolution, while it has improved quite a bit, the display resolution was good enough for radiology. And in many cases, it's still not good enough for pathology, right? So one can argue, no, well, that's an excuse. But actually, if you, if you did a very objective review, the resolution of many of the displays is still not at par with some of the use cases, not all use cases, but some of the use cases in pathology. So those are some of the stark differences. As far as the clinical benefits are concerned, they'll be identical, almost identical to radiology. But as far as the adoption is concerned, there are some rate limiting factors which stem from the differences between pathology and radiology. In hearing from both Laurent and Ajit, it seems that this idea of interoperability has been a real barrier to wider adoption of digital pathology. Let's hear from Mike Isaacs, who is head of pathology informatics and business development from Washington University in St. Louis. What exactly do we mean by interoperability and why is it such a hindrance to the adoption of digital pathology? One of the big hurdles that we have had, and I kind of mentioned about different vendor scanning vendors, which eventually over time, they will become a commodity, right? But they can't be really yet because they all have their own format. That's what makes DICOM standards so essential that it doesn't matter what scanner I'm using, I can open it up with any viewer. And within that image, it's also storing multiple layers of information. 
And so I can send a consult to Mayo easily and they have all their information within that DICOM standard file, right? And they can open up that image and see the quality of that image, but then also have all the meta tag data that they need, whether that's patient name, date of birth, all of that information they need to be able to provide security for the patient to make sure that it is the right patient. And so I think the interoperability is complex even from the network standpoints and the different layers of softwares and and the APIs that you have between the two. But the first step we really need to get to as an industry is to have standard file formats, in my opinion. And And then that also leads to this standard file format, can any AI vendor run on run on this? Because right now, an AI vendor says, well, yeah, I can work with the Philips format, but I really can't work with the Aperio or vice versa. And so that's a hurdle trying to be a customer or a client or an institution trying to choose the right one. Which one is more integratable that, that I can use? And each one of them has true value, but each one of them has their own hurdles with that. For example, a good use case is frozen sections. If you're not able to, you may have the best scanner and it scans the best for frozen sections and has high quality and it's really fast. But if I'm not able to open the images within my LIS or within my infrastructure, then I move on to the next slide scanner to try to figure out what's the best one. And so I think these interoperabilities are hurdles, no question. But I think the beginning of it is getting a a standard file format. This episode of Digital Pathology Today has been brought to you in part by DJT Solutions, your single source for all your digital pathology requirements, from consultation services to system requirements, including installation, training, and life cycle support. Since 1995, DJT Solutions, we are your best choice for your best results. The global COVID-19 pandemic clearly gave us a shot in the arm or at least facilitated remote sign-out and telepathology. Regulatory barriers from both CLIA and FDA came down or at least were temporarily waived. So let's hear about these developments from Dr. Matthew Hanna from Memorial Sloan Kettering. Like you said, digital pathology has been around for the last couple decades and so many institutions who had already laid their foundation for digital pathology before the public health emergency this year were able to quickly pivot to supporting their pathologists and patients during that time. And many departments now are looking to invest in digital pathology systems playing catch up. So I believe it really was from the uh, leadership standpoint of each specific department or organization, if they invested in digital pathology before the pandemic hit this year, they were poised in a much better position to offer remote services and and digital diagnostics for their pathologists and their patients, as opposed to now needing to look at what technologies are available and hopefully having the expertise to implement and validate those. The presidential declaration of the public health emergency, that in itself had effects on telemedicine that allowed patient-facing clinicians a much expanded flexibility to provide and be reimbursed for patient care using telemedicine services. That, of course, did not apply to pathology laboratories since the labs are governed by CMS and CLIA regulations, which, as you stated, was the enforcement discretion provided in March by CMS. And in regards to the CLIA regulations requiring pathologists to be on site at that CLIA certified lab. So another temporary enforcement discretion was in relation to an FDA guidance document that allowed vendors to market non-510K clear digital pathology systems for use during the public health emergency. Those still need to be properly validated in terms of validating the hardware and software, but there were essentially no more major regulatory barriers blocking laboratories from enabling their digital pathology systems with the CMS and FDA enforcement discretions. And speaking of regulations, there certainly appears to be misconceptions around the purpose of regulations or what regulations allow us to do, particularly around the FDA. So do we need FDA approval or clearance to implement digital pathology or remote sign-out? Again, let's hear from Matthew Hanna from Memorial Sloan Kettering. Right. That's very true. This is a common misconception 
the FDA does not regulate how healthcare is practiced. And so the FDA's role is to clear vendors' products, hardware and or software for specific intended uses. And so the FDA's clearance of those devices or digital pathology systems is really based on the intended use and allows that vendor to market their digital pathology system for that specific intended use. So taking primary diagnosis, for instance, the vendor is not able to market their system for primary diagnosis unless they've been cleared by the FDA for that intended use. And there's a whole process for that 510k clearance. However, as I mentioned, the FDA does not regulate how healthcare is practiced, does not regulate how pathologists are able to practice. And that's really up to that laboratory's accreditation body, which, for instance, the College of American Pathologists or in certain states is a state-specific Department of Health, they have to follow those guidelines and inspection criteria for accreditation of their laboratory where they have their cadence of inspections. And so based on the, for instance, College of American Pathologists whole slide imaging validation guidelines, if they have documentation of the validation specific from that accreditation body, that acts as the accreditation or validation of that digital pathology system for that accreditation body. And so at the end of the day, as long as the laboratory follows specific accreditation body guidelines or validation guidelines of their digital pathology system, they are able to use that for that validated purpose. And so that can include non-cleared or cleared FDA systems. Uh, that are available in the in the market today. And to many, regulation can seem like a burden or even a hindrance. But does it have to be that way? Let's hear from Dr. Joe Lenners, Associate Chief of Pathology at Mass General Hospital and the Digital Pathology Alliance on the burgeoning new field of regulatory sciences. How can we as pathologists get in the driver's seat and help unlock the potential of digital pathology through regulation? And when you look at the the regulatory complexity of all the systems that pathologists touch from a, you know, making things safe and efficient perspective and putting that, let's say, into documents, right? There are general documents. There are some that are directly tied to the devices. There are, you know, things about computer-assisted technologies. There's obviously a ton of software that we use. And then we get into the data business and, and cybersecurity, if you wish. Now, when you mirror those individual pieces with, let's just call it guidance documents from the FDA, it becomes so so intricate that certain tasks, you would combine a complete set of these documents in a completely different way. The term for that on the regulator side is the intended use. And it is very hard to anchor a one document to the full spectrum of digital pathology. Now, I know that, you know, no one really likes to hear about regulations, but it's almost like that every institute, every pathology lab has their intricate ways of doing things their own way. And regulating that is highly complex. So some of the efforts that are being undertaken by the, by the Digital Pathology Alliance is first off to dissect out this complexity, to really raise awareness that if we're not doing it, if we're not providing domain input into the regulatory decision making, who will actually do it? And I would argue, you know, should be us rather than some other scientists or some other people that are not doing the day-to-day -day work in clinical practice. And at the same time, taking this gigantic, let's say, potpourri of, of elements and dissecting it out into functional uh, work groups. So there's a whole pre-analytics work group. There are work groups on slide scanning and so forth to cover really everything from specimen acquisition all the way to reporting and, and data integration. These efforts that we do in the Alliance are in a very complicated mental framework, which is regulatory science, which is, it's almost a meta level. It's not how to scan a slide. It's not necessarily the practical aspects. How to make sure that the regulations mirror what we're thinking so that the regulations fully unlock the potential rather than hinder it. I think most of us have heard about the looming global pathology workforce shortage for the past 10 to 20 years. 
Let's hear from Dan Milner, the chief medical officer for the ASCP, to get his unique perspective on this issue. How can technology help alleviate this strain, and what are we not thinking about when contemplating such a shortage? If we step back a little bit from that and say, what is the pep- what is the shortage in laboratory workforce? Full stop. We know there's a shortage, right? So if we if we're looking at the whole laboratory and the personnel that we need to be able to get the work done in the U.S. domestically, globally, internationally, whatever country you're in, there just aren't enough people that are in the labs working. When you dig down into that, for example, data from our workforce surveys or our wage and vacancy surveys that ASCP does every two years, we find that it, in any given aspect of the laboratory, excluding pathologists, so the laboratory professionals, there's often a, a, an 8 to 10 percent deficit, right? So, so people are at about 90 percent where they need to be um, for any given laboratory. Some are even worse than that, uh, but some and some are better. But you know, it's around a 10 percent vacancy. So everybody is having every lab is having to give about 110 percent to make up for that, you know, 10 percent deficit that's there. And that's not a sustainable possibility. You, know, you don't want your workforce working so hard all the time. They have to have vacation. They have to have time and flexibility, etc. When we flip that over to pathologists, uh, we see something very similar. I agree with you that academic drive versus the community practice drive is real. That, that's absolutely true. But some would argue if you have a true shortage, if you don't have enough pathologists in the country for the volume that you expect to be produced, whether it's academic or community practice, someone's going to feel that, right? The academic team is going to feel it or the community practice is going to feel it. So one community practice may be you know, at just the right level, they're making enough money, they're as busy as they want to be, but another community practice may be overwhelmed and say, gosh, we really need to hire more people, et cetera. So geographic differences really come into play with regard to shortage of workforce. But if we if we look at that outside of the US, for example, in Africa, take everything I've said and just multiply it times 10. You know, there are tenfold fewer pathologists, tenfold fewer laboratorians, and that's a conservative estimate. And so there's there's massive shortages and work can't be done. In fact, what's happened is if you look at, you know, your average African country, a, an African pathologist will think our lab is really busy because we have 2,500 samples a year. In the U.S., 2,500 samples a year, that lab would shut down. It just wouldn't have enough volume to stay alive. The, the really sad truth of that is that the lab in Africa that's doing 2,500 samples per year, it's costing them more per sample to do that than what it would cost that lab in the U.S. that gets shut down. But because there are market forces and business models driving those decisions, in Africa, it just keeps happening, inefficiency, waste, et cetera. But in the U.S., you know, it's shut down and another lab comes into play. So it is a really fascinating topic. What I think has been ignored, Joe, and I, and I think this is a really important concept for anybody who's listening to this podcast is thinking about digital pathology. What I think has been ignored over the last 30 years is the onset of innovation. When when the study was done in the 70s or 80s to say we're going to have a shortage in the 2000s of pathologists, they didn't know we were going to have whole site imaging. They didn't know we were going to have artificial intelligence. They didn't know immunostochemistry chemistry was going to have blown up and turned into not only a diagnostic, but a therapeutic kind of service or that molecular was going to advance to the point where, you know, with a few markers from a tumor, you can predict its behavior. All of those tools have to be put in place when we're thinking about workforce. And so, you know, we I have a model that I've developed in the work we do at ASCP that predicts exactly how many pathologists you need for a given country and finalizing that model and looking at some test cases. But in the US, the model suggests we need about 18,000 and we have about 14, 15,000 depending on who you ask. So there is a deficit, right? The model says right now there's a deficit. But if you take just the cervical cancer screening volume or the colon cancer screening volume, which currently depends on you know colonoscopy or, or colosco- uh, colposcopy, et cetera, for a pathologist to review those slides, if you dial that down with the effect of HPV vaccination, with the effect of HPV testing, with the effect of things like Cologuard, uh, where you don't need to necessarily do colonoscopy, if you dial it down even two or three percentage points from where it is now, suddenly you need thousands of fewer pathologists and, and the, you know, the volumes just quickly diminish. If you look at AI, where AI may be able to look at digital pathology images, whole site images of cases for pathologists and triage those cases, they're predicting eight to tenfold increase in productivity of a given pathologist. So if they're able to sign out 40 cases a day now, they can sign out 400 cases a day if we have AI. If you suddenly put that into the mix, 
that workforce shortage goes down very quickly. And so I have, I actually fear that what's going to happen is, although we keep predicting shortage, predicting shortage, that as these AI tools develop and they become FDA approved and they're available, suddenly we're going to be on the other side of that problem where we have too many pathologists right. and pathologists are going to be fighting for things to do. And again, that's why I go back to my earlier point about histotechnologists and pathologists embracing digital pathology, embracing AI, embracing molecular, even if they didn't study molecular, to make sure they are at the leading edge of that so they're still relevant in their healthcare system and they can stay on top of this innovation as it develops and changes the dynamic of the number of people that we need in the workforce. Dr. Milner clearly has a unique perspective on this, focusing not only on the pathologist workforce, but also everyone who works in laboratory medicine and even specialties outside of pathology and new technologies and how making ourselves obsolete might not necessarily be a bad thing, but there's always going to be winners and losers. Now let's hear from Ajit Singh. I think a common theme is that in the U.S., in aggregate, perhaps we may not have a shortage, but we don't have the right specialists where we need them. And how can digital pathology help alleviate this burden? So let's talk about the shortage globally and then in the United States. So globally, there are about 30,000 anatomical pathologists. About 15 or 17,000 of them are in the United States for a population of 300 million people. 300 plus million people. For a population of 1.3 odd billion people in India, take a guess how many pathologists are in India, anatomical mm. pathologists. The no. number is 1,000. So is there shortage of pathologists? Absolutely, yes. It's obvious. Right? Now let's talk about the United States. Is there shortage of pathologists at an aggregate level? The answer is probably no. But is there shortage of pathologists in how they are distributed? Absolutely, yes. So is there ample number of pathologists available in say San Francisco or Dallas or New York or Chicago, Cleveland, Rochester, Minnesota, absolutely yes. But if I go to Sioux City, Iowa, or if I go to Little Rock, Arkansas, do I have similar numbers and in the requisite number of subspecialties in pathology? The answer is absolutely not. So even if the aggregate numbers are right, the distribution and the subspecialties those numbers are not right. So now imagine being able to virtualize this whole universe, which means I, the, the image and the pathologist do not need to be at the same place at the same time. Like let's disintermediate that. Let's first dissociate the two and then disintermediate. Then the pathologist could be where the pathologist needs to be or the radiologist needs to be. And the image is where the image is or close to where the patient was or is. That opens up a whole array of possibilities of being able to utilize the talent where it exists and not the talent where, it, where the patient is or where the image is. One of the themes that's emerged in 2020 is that digital pathology is real. It is the current reality. It's not pie in the sky talk anymore. It's not something that may happen someday. It's with us now and people are signing out cases for primary diagnosis remotely. But is this the end of the road? It certainly is a huge milestone, but as Mark Tuttle, head of pathology informatics at Henry Ford Health System tells us, this may just be the boring part, getting all the sl slides scanned and being able to be viewed remotely. Now it's really going to get exciting. What can we do with these images once they're digitized? And people call this various things. It's machine learning, it's machine vision, it's artificial intelligence. They're really all just different words that describe the same behaviors. But these behaviors can be organized really in a couple of different ways. One is quantitatively, we can use the computer to count things. And the other is qualitatively, we can use the computer to identify things. And that includes matching a, t a tumor type with a tumor type, and computers do that very well right now. It's actually looking at desmoplastic tissue. Computers do that very well right now. Counting is a given. Counting mitoses, counting cell types, counting immunohistochemistry markers. What really hasn't been done is to get these opportunities, let's put it that way, to put these opportunities into a workflow so that they can be invoked by a pathologist at their workstation as they're doing their work. And this is really what the grail of digitizing all of our pathology will lead us to. Because once we have it all digitized, now we will be able to e evoke plugins or different types of applications right on the screen while we're looking at something that can actually look at and analyze that tissue. 
But that has not really been well done yet. Right now, it's like you bring up your digital pathology image, you work with it, and then you might take it and push it over here to this program that would give you some image analysis capabilities or some quantitative capabilities. There are very few devices that have this integrated directly into the whole slide image viewer, for example. And is this even the end? Imagine full-scale adoption of digital pathology combined with our ability to multiplex, overlaid with artificial intelligence and machine learning systems that will allow us to develop complex algorithms to provide predictive and prognostic information to doctors and patients. Is there something even beyond this, or is this the holy grail? Tony Magliocco from Protein Diagnostics seems to think there's always going to be more. There's always going to be the next great thing, and this perhaps is just the beginning. Yeah, that, that, that's certainly exciting to think about as we add the dimensionality of the, you know, decoding all these other biomarkers and being able to measure them simultaneously. And I do think it is the, the, the next step, but I don't, I don't think it's the end by any means, because you, you have to remember that tissue is a living thing. And when we fix it and make a slide of it, you know, we've, we've tortured it. We've pulled it out of the patient. We've shocked it. We've doused it in a chemical. We've embedded it in wax. And we've done all these terrible things to it. So that process may have changed it in a way that changes its biology. Also, we may want to keep the tissue living so that we can understand how it reacts to things. So you might be able to imagine in the future, if we go beyond histology, there might be ways to image tissue while we keep it alive, or maybe even image it in vivo. If we can remove it and keep it alive, we might be able to subject it to other treatments. You know, perhaps we could give it experimental treatments and see how does it respond to that. So I think there's still a lot more beyond, you know, just the uh, multiplexing analysis. I agree with you, the multiplexing is dramatic, gives us dramatically more information and will carry us much further down the road for sure. But I, I don't think it's an end that there's going to be more things after that for sure. It's been quite a year. Thank you for being with us on Digital Pathology today. Happy New Year. Thank you to everyone involved. I'm Joe Anderson. Our producer is Danny Schreiber, and our editor is Tessa Hall. And we at Digital Pathology Today are just getting started. Stay tuned next year for many more episodes exploring hot topics such as artificial intelligence, interoperability, the business case for digital pathology, return on investment, future-proofing your system, and much, much more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on Digital Pathology Today. <music>